All right, we are talking with Tova Perlmutter, uh, Executive Director of the Sugar Law Center in Detroit. Tova, how are you this morning? I'm doing great, Ron. Thank you. Um, you know, back in June, the Sugar Law Center uh, initiated a pioneering and historic lawsuit that challenged the emergency manager law that had been just enacted at that point uh, by the Michigan legislature. So you sued uh, the state of Michigan. That's right. Uh, That's right. Saying that there's something that didn't smell right around this lawsuit and you wanted to challenge it. And at the time, I think Benton Harbor was the only uh, city in, in Michigan that actually had a, uh, a manager of that kind. Uh, and certainly, my larger point is that people in Detroit did not really, I think, understand exactly the importance of the law or how it might relate to people in the city of Detroit. That certainly has changed. Uh, the emergency manager law, the possibility of an emergency manager being appointed to oversee and step in uh, in the city of Detroit is very real. It's top of mind. And so could you give us an update? First of all, when did you file the lawsuit? What's it about? And then can you give us an update? Sure, yeah. Well, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, as soon as the law came out, our constitutional experts really were just horrified and, and shocked. Um, and what we've been saying all along is that people do not understand it, that we need to get more and more of the people, both in, Mich in Detroit and Michigan as a whole, to understand the affront to democracy that is represented by this law. I don't think people get it, that the law essentially says that if you have money, you can have voting rights. You can have some level of democracy in your community and some say over what goes on in your community. But if you don't, if your community is not affluent and wealthy, then you may lose your elected officials, you will lose collective bargaining for your public employees, you will potentially lose even the autonomy and existence of your community. Um, and, and that the triggers for making this happen is essentially at the governor's sole discretion. Um, they have a list of 18 triggers and thresholds that could make it, factors that could make it happen, but the last one is, or any other uh, evidence that the governor considers to be a sign of need. Uh, and we find this outrageous. Uh, we went to court, as you suggested, as you said, in June, um, because uh, it took a while to, the, the law passed in March, actually, but we wanted to make sure that we had every argument as well conceived and, and presented as possible. Possible. And we also had 28 individuals from all over the state who said this shall not stand and who came forward to be plaintiffs in the lawsuit. And so we needed to really understand their stories and pull it together to try to, again, influence the courts, make the argument in court to say this law should be struck down as a violation to the Michigan Constitution, but also to make the case to the public to help the people of Michigan understand what is being done to their fundamental rights. So, uh, the state of Michigan has moved to potentially fast track. Usually a lawsuit will make its way, wend its way through lower courts before it ends up, say, at the Michigan Supreme Court. And the state of Michigan has moved to potentially fast track this immediately to the Michigan Supreme Court. What is an, uh, today is actually an important date. Uh, and what what is the, what is the update? Where does that process stand? Well, it's very interesting because actually uh, the process by which the governor requested a fast track is this very rarely used court rule uh, that was created sort of to help the state cope with really urgent matters that could not be resolved over an extended period in the standard court system. Uh, and the governor sent this um, you know, urgent message to the Supreme Court back in August saying this has to be resolved right away. Well, here we are in December, December 14th, and uh, six weeks ago, the Supreme Court finally issued an order saying, well, we'd like to see what both sides have to say about whether we should even accept the case. So today is the day that those briefs are due, and we'll be very interested to see how the state defends the idea that something is so urgent that it has to be addressed instantly without bringing forward the facts, without involving the, the established judicial system that has worked well for our state, you know, for many, 
many decades. Um, yeah. so, so we'll be interested to see that. I should also mention, though, that while that request is being considered, the district court, uh, the circuit court, I should say, the trial court, is still moving ahead with the case. And so discovery has been uh, has been served. Um, we have considerable information that the state was required to turn over, and we're moving ahead with the case on the assumption that the Supreme Court will not take this very unusual step. So, uh, for the record, um, I hear increasing talk, I think out of frustration, among a lot of people, even in Detroit, and certainly in the metropolitan area, that say, you know, things are so messed up in the city now, and un undeniably there is a financial uh, shortfall and crisis that the city is is um, in the middle of that maybe we do need an emergency manager to come in and clean things up what would you say to them how do you respond to that well I guess I have a number of responses to that um, I mean one is that the emergency manager position as it has been outlined is fundamentally anti-democratic and so it prevents the people of Detroit having any say over how the mess is cleaned up. That in itself is an outrage. Secondly, the way it is outlined is in such a way that any solution that is drawn will necessarily be at the sacrifice of the taxpayers and public employees with no sacrifice whatsoever on the part of bondholders and Wall Street. And so, you know, when you look at, well, yes, there is a financial crisis, there's a crisis going on around the country, and it was not created by, uh, you know, just a few people making making some bad decisions in the last 10 or 20 years. We have a basic economic situation, we have a decline in manufacturing, and we have uh, shenanigans that were you know, done by the entire financial industry. Detroit has to bear its share of the problems that emerge from that, but to suggest that the way to solve it is in to put all of the costs on the local people and none on those who created the problem seems to us to be very wrongheaded. So, um, if people would like to learn more about the historic lawsuit, it takes a lot of money to uh, sue uh, the state of Michigan. Uh, what, uh, where would they go? What, where's your uh, website and how can they learn more and perhaps consider making uh, a donation to support your work? Well, I appreciate your asking that because in fact we're a very small organization and we've had the few lawyers that we have are staying up, you know, all night working on the case. Uh, democracyemergency.org. Democracyemergency.org is the website where we are highlighting what happens in the case. There's a Q&A there for people with just the kind of questions you asked about, well, isn't this necessary or how can we avoid it? Uh, the actual law is there for people to look at and all of the legal documents responding to it. So anyone who's interested can go there and yes, they can also make a donation if they want to help us fight this. Uh, obviously, the state has a lot more lawyers than we have working on the case. All right. Thank you, Tova. Tova Perlmutter, Executive Director, Sugar Law Center. Thanks so much. Thanks.